Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and of course, uh, we have Christina Consola. She was on last week, and uh, I guess your website is FukushimaFacts.com, FukushimaFacts.com, and you have uh, a show called Nuked Radio. That's a pretty good term, Nuked Radio. That's pretty uh, in your face, Nuked Radio. And I guess since you were on last week, uh, Christina, you had a number, quite a few new uh, people that joined your blogs, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, people need to check out the facts. Does it tell... Repeatedly, uh, the Nutramedical Report Clay and Iron Show is not a cult. We are not conspiracy theorists. We are conspiracy scientists. And the first conspiracy is the silence by the media, the inaction by so-called government and or corporate agencies. This is not a theory. Theory is something that has a number of suspicions which you have to go test the facts. But once you have the facts, it's no longer a theory. So when we're talking about things like the effects of radiation, the inaction by not only the government, but the IAEA, the United Nations, the United States. Obama's prancing around preparing for the next election, and no one's doing anything about Fukushima. Nobody's doing anything about being assaulted with radiation. And even Senator Wyden's office has been completely, uh, I've been told, if you're not an Oregon resident, by the way, my son is, and I'll have him contact them, but they're not responding to me at all now for over a month. I recently, though, contacted Senator Dianne Feinstein's office, and I expect to hear something back. The supposed expert in nuclear safety basically knows very little. And so what I see is incompetence and uh, rookies that really are putting the public in danger because they're not acquiring data, they're not making decisions, and they're not op operating to apply the pressure they could op apply pressure to actually have an action plan to deal with either remediating the site over at Fukushima, advising people of the dangers of radiation, and even collecting data either through use of these hundreds of thousands of drones they have that could have radiation detectors, or putting them in commercial airliners. But of course, we know that our airline uh, pilots and stewards and stewardesses are exposed to radiation when they fly at higher altitudes. But what about if you fly through a radiation plume that's 20 or 30,000 times more radiation than the background level of cosmic background radiation, x-rays, etc., just for flying at a higher altitude. We want to know where these plumes are. Uh, we, I call this whole thing the uh, Fukushima plume gate, and uh, we're not getting any information, and the more we push, in fact, it's a bigger conspiracy, the conspiracy of silence. The latest, of course, is that they're trying to remove some one-third of the fuel rods that are newer, which are more likely to go critical from Fukushima cooling pool 4. Because if this plant decides to blow, which is likely to happen if the fuel seals break in that pool, no amount of pumps or assist pumps, which are kind of being held together by bailing wire and chewing gum, are going to prevent the fuel rod assemblies from blowing. And there's 1,535 of them, uh, likely to create a radiation cloud, according uh, to some of the top experts, of 30 to 100 times more radiation uh, than last year released if only 10% of those fuel rod assemblies go. So the situation is dire, and we have basically no action whatsoever. And that, is, that, is, that itself is a very major story that the world powers, Japanese government lying and even reburning trash that they average from highly radioactive trash to normal trash, is a crime of biblical proportions against the population of Earth and every biosphere on the planet. Not just the Northern Hemisphere. You can't be too smug in the Southern Hemisphere because you will eventually get this radiation, although it will take a while. Uh, Christina, tell us what you're hearing lately, because we've got a lot of issues to cover today. Well, I've, I've been reading about the, um, the conspiracy of the lead vests going on at TEPCO and, and other places uh, covering their dosimeters. Yeah, that's a really important thing. We had some good jokes on the uh, before the show today about covering dosimeters like that. Uh, yeah. Tell us about those, because this is a kind of like uh, otherworldly that, you know, people would use their lead vests to actually cover their dosimeter so they get artificially low readings for the workers and also the radiation readings on the site. And, and why this is so significant is because after a, a certain amount of exposure, these workers won't be allowed to work on the site, and they're already having trouble finding people to work there. 
you look at the long-term projections for, you know, 30 to 40 to 100 years to decommission the plant if it's even possible, um, you know, where are they going to get people to work there? Well, there's only six, there's 16 people that know the plant forward and backward. If they lose those people, they can't go and requisition people from other places that know the plant. And the other workers, a lot of them, are being sent there literally by the uh, Yakuza, the Japanese form of the mafia, to work out yeah. their debt. And they're completely brain brainless and don't have any idea what they're doing. Even if you were highly motivated and knew the plant backwards, if you go to these really heavily radioactive areas, you simply get so much radiation, you're a bumbling, drooling idiot by the time you get into these high radioactive zones. So even if you had a plan and we're going to do something in 10 or 20 or 30 or 60 minutes, you may well be so radioactive you can't even think straight by the time you get to where you're supposed to do what you're going to do. Um, I, I saw a video of the first two rods that were removed from Reactor 4 last week where the workers are actually wiping the rods off with the cloth by hand. Wiping off rods with the cloth. Try to reduce the, uh, the external, you know, the exposure coming off the rod. So I don't think that a little cap. cloth is going to stop gamma rays, do you? No. Nope. Gamma rays and high energy neutron, high energy uh, neutrons that are coming off if there's any criticality, high energy electrons coming out of the beta particle emissions are going to do zip. It may stop alpha particle emissions, but that's it. Yeah, it's a problem. I feel it terrible is. for those people. Um, you know, when this happened in Russia, they uh, sent buses out to take 30,000 miners out of the town to get them to dig under the plant, and it, they didn't really have a choice. They were put on the bus and, and taken there, but, I mean, they, they dealt with it the way it needed to be dealt with. Well, they can do tunneling machines. If they had a tunneling machine, and if they also created uh, took uh, created containers and lined them with depleted uranium, do you lining of containers snapped together like a red Lego set? would allow you to block the neutron flux that could cause damage and the gamma rays. And they could have workers walk in and out and have much less exposure. Uh, we also have a range of nutraceuticals that they could take along with the proper rad suits, which have been designed by the Russians. They could significantly reduce the radiation exposure, but we don't have that. We don't also have cable robots, which are robots running cables, or what's called radiation-resistant robots with IEEE Promium ferromagnetic chips that were designed for deep space and used against EMP war warfare. But the government doesn't want to come clean to the fact that they have radiation-resistant electronic circuits and ICs that are otherwise fried by gamma rays and neutrons. They're not, uh, what we're seeing is absolutely no action. Nobody's hauling anything out of Warehouse 13. And uh, if anything goes, and we're talking about multiple things could go, reactor one, two, three, cooling pool four, if anything goes and the site becomes, un, uh, how can I say, completely unserviceable, which right now, they're, what their primary thing they do on the weekend is, believe it or not, go home. They go home. They don't do anything. They go home. There's nobody doing anything. There's nobody tunneling under to create a corium catcher. Nobody building a seawall. Nobody putting Kevlar spider silk tents over it. Nobody setting up an air filtration system to convert the radioactive dust and nanoparticles into a solid waste. Nobody transporting the highly radioactive water in double hull ships to a place where it can be properly converted. Basically, they're dumping thousands of tons of radioactive water every day. 83% plus of the radiation is being dumped out in the ocean or in the air and it's venting eastward toward us and circulating the planet many, many times before it becomes salted in the oceans around the world through the black or Humboldt current, uh, which it carries around the world. So it takes two and a half years to completely circulate the planet. So in one year and a couple of months, it will have circulated through the oceanographic currents. But the jet stream and the other currents have been carrying around the world many, many times. So uh, we're going to have background radiation, literally cesium, strontium, and heavy isotopes everywhere on the planet. Um, that's what's so disturbing about this is people don't get it that we're already into the biological effects of a World War III scenario without the cities on fire. Right. Yeah, we are under nuclear attack. Yeah, we're and we don't have... We're learning every day about how these isotopes behave um, out, outside of the reactors. In fact, uh, they, they had published some data a few months back about it, the RADs being re-released as the ground heats up just from the, the sun. Um, yes. You know, after rain, uh, re-releasing. Um, plus, plus the, plus the uh, burn if you have fires, like the fires from the uh, in Arizona and New Mexico after the above ground testing released radiation that was stored there 30, 40, 50 years ago from above ground nuclear testing.
Welcome back. And we're joined by Christina Consolo. Her website is FukushimaFacts.com. You have a lot of links from that, including your blogs, etc., YouTube channel. Um, we've got a lot of uh, points to cover today, Christina. I'd like you to kind of expand on some of these. Uh, the uh, uh, first one, of course, was the uh, fuel rod uh, removal is underway over at TEPCO. I believe we're wiping, wiping off the rods by hand, which we talked about. Thyroid numbers in Japan, contamination measured in versus cysts grown in high percentage compared to Nagasaki. So that's an E&E news, and we're going to post those links up. The large number of nuke plants having electrical computer problems in the past week after the sun flares. And uh, Nine Mile Point, New York, uh, Limerick Point, um, uh, the Quad Cities, Illinois, just to name a few. And I think you've expanded that list uh, since then. We know that uh, not only do we have the uh, three different types of, of material that comes from the sun, we have electrons, which come first. Then we have... Um, Neutrons, a neutron flux from the sun, and then we have, of course, the plasma. So there's actually three different phases, and they come in three different ways if you have a coronal mass ejection or a sun, a sunspot or a storm. If it's a geocentric storm in the same directory as Earth, you can have a Carrington. I do mean it is C, not H. It's a Carrington effect, 1859. That can cause some real problems. And the other thing is that the sun activity does change the half-life uh, of nuclear reactions and can change the... Uh, if you want to call the the nuclear flux uh, reactivity of of uh, nuclear ions in a unstable or a critical reaction, so uh, it can have effect on it. Besides inducing power on the power lines coming from plants, they have to turn down the power output. It can cause station blackout. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that can happen from uh, sunspots that can make nuclear reactors very very fragile. So um, let's expand on that a bit. Yeah, that's a question that I had posed to several experts on, on, on my show was the information about the decay rates that had come out in 2010 that was first reported by Purdue and later uh, by Stanford that the uh, sun activity would correlate to a change in decay rates. Um, whether or not the sun activity would change or adversely affect the, uh, the contents of nuclear reactors, no one's been able to really answer that for me. Right. Well, it does change the uh, rate of the T1.5. The, the way it works is this, and, and Nikola Tesla talked with Marie Curie back in the 1920s on it, and what he basically said was that uh, depending on what's called the time sequence of scalar uh, atomic frequencies, you can actually change what's called the, the uh, if you want to call it the atomic blue that holds together an atom, in a sense, by hitting a certain harmonic frequencies. And in the periodic table of elements, it hit the atomic frequency spectra of a non-radioactive isotope of the elements in the same periodic table, you'll shatter off the radioactive components and cause it to decay at a much more accelerated rate. So he said he could change the T the T one half or the decay rate. That's pretty significant, whether you're making nuclear bombs or having nuclear reactors, because it does change when there's solar spots and it occurs even before the the first wave actually hits. So before the uh, the electron surge hits the Earth, before the neutrons hit and before the uh, plasma hits the planet, there's an actual change that can be detected even beforehand, so there's a, a change in the curvature and if you want to call density of the Higgs boson or time space continuum that occurs even before we get hit with the energy of the coronal mass ejection. It's interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Very interesting, and, and I would think that a lot more uh, physicists would, would be concerned about it as well and how it may affect reactor operations because what we're seeing is uh, mostly electrical problems that are occurring in a number of plants. There were eight last week, just today. Well, uh, Fermi, Fermi oh. 2, Calvert yeah. Cliff, and Oyster Creek, and, and all these plants that were built in the late 60s, so they're right. very old as well. Plus, the um, fuel rods, as they get old, get yeah, more touchy. They, get more, they go to your scram, exactly. They, also, the fuel rod assemblies get more touchy. In other words, they can go hot real quickly which means it's really hard to keep them cooled down when there's a coronal mass ejection occurring. The other is MOX reactors are hot as Hades. They're basically the real, real touchy. So we have a mixed oxygen fuel plutonium reactor, which can take an old plant and increase its power up by 30 to 40, 50 percent. Those reactors, which are, very, in a sense, breeder reactors that generate more plutonium, those are dangerous, and they're also very, very hot. And when you have a station blackout or a surge in power, they can go critical really quickly. 
Yeah, when you have a, a hot shutdown or a hot standby situation, too, there's still um, you know, gas that's being produced that has to be dealt with. And that's another thing that we're seeing. These seals keep failing on plants. Um, Prairie Island had a seal failure today. Um, that's um, high on our list. In fact, we have a web page just for Prairie Island Nuclear Generating Station because well, it had plants had so many problems. Last week, we went over the data with Chris Harris. That's our uh, radio name of Chris Harris, our nuclear expert, last Thursday. And what he said was these tubes that San Onofre vibrate because of the steam generation, there's a basic defect in the design. He added more tubes, and the plant was originally designed for all steam turbines, and there two that they added were 600 million apiece. They vibrated, and they literally banged against each other until they decayed and caused a major, major break in the, the non-radioactive, the radioactive loop for steam. And so it was venting off radioisotopes probably for years. But when they have a hot shutdown, this increases dramatically, and the plant literally burnt out, you know, thousands of tubes. Um, it looks to me like, you know, they're trying to, to rearrange the deck chairs and see if they can get it back activated, but it looks like these term, steam turbines will have to be pulled and have to be re-engineered completely. Uh, the problem with all these reactors, too, is that all of them are st storing radioactive material on site. Many, many of them have, we call it, like the Mark I General Electric Reactor, and there's 25-plus in America, and they have done some re-engineering uh, 20 years after they originally installed them in what's called the Taurus for getting venting off hydrogen. Uh, they did a faux engineering in Japan, which meant they had an argument between two groups of engineers knowing that there was a faux engineering, which was a false engineering, so couldn't handle the pressures of releasing the hydrogen because they thought it would cause a hydrogen-generated explosion, which could also compress the corium and cause a nuclear reaction or an explosion, a nuclear explosion. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, in reactor number one, which is right over a fault line, Reactor 1 in Japan actually exploded because it went critical. They had, they still have neutron beams coming from Reactor 1 that you can see from space 35, 40 miles away. And especially at sundown, you see these blue beams of neutron jetting through the air, creating uh, nitrogen-generated uh, blue light when the mm -hmm. neutrons hit the nitrogen. So um, it tells me that a lot of the people that are involved with this use what I call very sharp engineering pencils, and they have a very low on what's called their... Uh, uh, their EQ, their ethics quotient. Their ethics quotient is like maybe one or two, just slightly above a bacterium. Uh, they may have a high IQ, but they very have a low EQ. Well, a lot of the decisions made, too, in terms of the, the safety of the plants is only for a, a short-term fix. The NRC approved the spent fuel pools to piggyback the rods that are stored there because we don't have a long-term facility. This was, I, I think, four or five years ago. So that plants like uh, Vermont Yankee, whose fuel pools are full, could now double the number of rods that were stored in there safely, which means they're closer together. Right, and those rods are more likely to get hot. You have another thing here you mentioned about the high neutron flux events at Nine Mile Point in, uh, that's uh, just outside New York City, right? Correct. So when we get back, we'll talk about that. Uh, and, of course, the... Uh, Popular Mechanics has been running lots of stories about the SHTF in capital letters, and people know what that means now, and making bug out bags starting in February 2012. Well, we'll talk about those when we come back with Christina Consolo. Stay tuned. back and um, interesting if you go to spaceweather.com you can see the coronal mass ejection the uh, once every five to ten years is one that comes out as fast as this it's a rare speed of 2930 kilometers per second or 6.5 million miles per hour uh, it started out uh, apparently the source sunspot AR 1520 which is this really bad one it sparked many bright auroras earlier this month uh, when it was on an Earth side of the sun. Now, however, the active region is transiting away. So luckily it wasn't uh, what's called geoeffective or geocentric heading toward the Earth. If it had, this is a very powerful uh, CME, and of course it would have had uh, effects on satellites, ground-based communication, and it has effects on nuclear reactions and nuclear reactors as well. It has biological effects, too, in living organisms, makes them antsy, and it can also charge up the, you know, the tectonic plates charges up the ionosphere so it kind of screws up the climate because remember the climate is steered by higher uh, charged particles in the upper atmosphere 
Um, so that's part of the reason why the climate's crazy, along with the most important reason, the disconnection of the loop current caused by the British Petroleum disaster that still they're settling the legal suits, but they haven't settled this. Well, the lawsuits need to be continued, but also we need to have lawsuits to stop the Japanese from burning trash. We need to have our senators and congressmen get off their duff to actually do something rather than preparing for the next election. And uh, uh, this is pretty bizarre. Um, then, of course, we have the, you got some other interesting things about the Chernobyl Pines re-releasing their RADs came out last week on ENE News. Let's talk about that for a moment. Yeah, um, uh, we had talked about they were asking for uh, help from the worldwide community about decontaminating their forests so that we don't end up with a, a huge contamination problem in Europe again. And, um, you know, it's uh, it, obviously a direct correlation to the, the wildfires that were happening here. In fact, our averages have been dropping since uh, some of those plumes from the wildfire smoke moved through the Midwest. And I'm, that data has been uh, posted by several crowdsourced resources. Right. We need to get a lot of that information organized into to one uh, institution and also to develop um, a test and so forth and, and some strict guidelines about the use of Geiger counters, getting them calibrated, and uh, having people take a test so that we know people who are giving us those numbers are doing them accurately and then we can get uh, you know more people to pay attention to some of these because that's you know obviously a concern that uh, the numbers that we're getting are reliable I like, can you know correlate some of that with, with what I'm seeing but there's such a wide variation in the way that these isotopes behave when they're out in the environment and these plumes go through they, they tend to bioaccumulate or stick together you can have a, a big difference in your uh, radiation levels just, you know, on the other side of the block or down the street. Exactly. You may be witnessing. Yeah, the other thing, too, is that the uh, radiation, um, I was on uh, Rents last week, and he made a comment that he said, oh, well, these things are just going to drift across the ocean and you just get aerosolized. I said, no, no, radioisotopes are sucked up by life forms at an enormous rate. For example, whether it's plutonium, strontium, uranium, americium, the, the living forms, whether it's bacteria or mold or fungi or just any life form, is going to suck up radioactive isotopes far faster than the other elements in the same place in the periodic table of elements. So cesium, right. radioactive cesium or radioactive strontium is absorbed far faster than regular strontium or regular thorium or whatever. These, these isotopes are absorbed much more quickly because they're more energetic. When the body sees that energetic, it acts in a sense, it activates the chaperone mechanisms to absorb it. It absorbs it faster uh, than regular isotopes. So they're going to be bioincorporated, and they're going to also go through the food chain quickly. So you'll see bioaccumulation. So top life forms like bluefin tuna are showing 100% high levels of cesium-137, cesium-134, and strontium-90. It means that the bioaccumulation in the environment is through the food chain is going to happen much more quickly than you would have otherwise have uh, expected. And those numbers are going to keep going up as time goes on, and we're looking at, at decades, possibly centuries, as some physicists have uh, declared, before um, you know we we are able to decommission, if even possible. Well, then they, we, we have to do is, we have to think of other technologies, just like Tesla talked about. The idea we have to start thinking out of the box of uh, can we speed up or change the rate of decay of these isotopes? Can we make them non-radioactive? And I believe we can. We have to also realize that if we don't have that technology, the world is poisoned and being poisoned considerably more very quickly. And uh, it could be literally we're on the front edge of an extinction-level event. Uh, now, these kind of things have happened in the past due to various things, whether it's solar activity, asteroids, etc., these methane hydrates. And we could have, and, and don't say it was caused by man. I hear people say, oh, it's man with CO2. Come on. It's like, you know, man is, a, is like a pimple on the back of an elephant. It's The biggest causes are volcanic volcanism under the oceans releasing hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide. Chlorofluorocarbons doesn't cause anything. It doesn't do anything to the upper atmosphere. It's molecules, you don't have a brick floating on the surface of your pool. They go to the bottom of the pool. Same with these isotopes. They go into the biosphere, and they very quickly uh, get bioaccumulated. And, of course, if they get too high a accumulation, 
the organisms literally in them die and go to the bottom of the ocean and become a geological layer, which is the way the biological systems used to sequester them. Now, of course, when they have forest fires, they re-release them. Or if idiots take trash and then burn it like these people in Japan, it's an international crime to re-release the radioisotopes. So they use a technique called averaging, where they average highly radioactive and non-radioactive materials. So uh, I repeatedly tell them First, that they, uh, they, they need to get seen, radiation. Uh, the, the effect on the thyroid, and there's been some numbers that have come out that are just mind-boggling. Recently, right. only, only less than 1% of uh, the children in Japan, even around Nagasaki, had thyroid cysts uh, 10 years ago when they did a control group analysis the hospitals in Fukushima are reporting contamination at over 50%, and 36% are showing evidence of nodules already. Yeah, it's easy to stop 100 that. 100 kilometers away from the plant. It's easy to stop it. If they take our Edgar Casey diatomic iodine, neutriodine, if they take Neutrochala, NIOSH N95 masks, because you go over three times background uh, counts per minute in your area. It's a stable, let's say, ours right now varies around two times background, but if it goes over three times, let's say to four times, it's time to break out your NIOSH masks. And in the most, probably when it's raining, it's, if it shoots up like that, you're going to get a real burst of radiation that you're going to breathe in. The problem is in, inhaled or, or in, ingested radiation from radioactive water. It gets in your water supply or your water, uh, reservoirs is much more dangerous than external radiation. You know, if you're an airline steward or pilot flying and you get a little bit of background radiation, there is a uh, hormesis effect where radiation stimulates enzymes to protect you. And you're, if you stay in your zone of compensation and you're otherwise healthy, you replace damaged cells and organelles very quickly, and it actually has a stimulatory effect at low levels. But when you have radioactive isotopes that get embedded in specific tissue, those tissues can't flush it. It's like having a Fukushima plant there constantly re damaging the DNA and the cell membranes until eventually the cells go crazy and you have a cancer. But long before cancer, you get vascular inflammation, you get oxidative stress, you get methylation disorders, so you get decrease in folic acid, B12, you get polyneuropathy, you get organic brain damage. You literally get what I call the Fukushima-induced zombie apocalypse that some of these silly bloggers have got out there now and they make stories about people eating faces and things like that. Well, the real issue is when you expose populations to rising level of radiation, at some point their cortical activity of their brain, their cortex, stops acting normal. Uh, you start to end up with frontal lobe dysfunction and higher executive functions, retinal problems, uh, higher metabolic tissues, uh, tissues that are turned over quickly like the Crip cells in your gut, the glial cells in the brain, uh, bone marrow, stem cells, etc. These target cells start to no longer function properly. And uh, when we come back, we'll talk about the radiation kit some more, but the basic kit is two NIOSH masks, two Neutrodyne, a Neutrotrala, Neutrodefense, and then of course I recommend you get Cell Detox Glutathione, Regenerax, Max, and a probiotic, living probiotic, living probiotic ultra to chelate out the heavy isotopes and organic liquid zeolite. Christina Consolo, your website again is FukushimaFacts.com. Uh, how can I listen to your radio show? It's uh, 1560 AM in the New York area, or you can uh, get to the station through the Internet. Orion Talk Radio now, Tuesdays and Thursdays from noon to 1, Eastern Standard Time. Noon to 1, okay, excellent, Eastern Standard Time. Now, uh, what's on the agenda for you? What do you think will happen in the next six months? Because... What I tell people to do is they need to take personal protection to realize that you are being exposed to radioisotopes. Uh, ideally, people should start thinking about radiation-free food, making sure their water is filtered. That's why we have a pure water system, which will make non-radioactive water. Systems like uh, the Cola Blue uh, can have distillate that still has uh, got toxins in it. Uh, Berkey systems will not pull out radioisotopes. They'll pull out cysts and bacteria and larger particles, but they will not pull out radioisotopes. Um, People need to be aware of the fact that um, that when they're flying, they may actually be flying through radiation plumes. The airline stewards and stewardesses have been reporting sick, not just Alaska Airlines, but American Airlines and others, 
my guess is that at times they're probably flying through radiation plumes and they're not being told because uh, these tend to be at very high altitudes. And my guess is having just tested when I flew up to Portland six weeks ago, we had a radiation plume that stayed north in Oregon. And when I got half hour into the flight, the radiation level fell to less than half what it was at the same altitude. So that tells me the radiation was considerably lower in California than it was in Oregon. And then when you check the jet stream, jet stream was further north at that time in uh, the summer. So uh, we have a lack of data, and we need to get people to contact their congressmen and their senators. Uh, they need to, if they want to reference me, they can contact me by going through the show or emailing. And I'm sending a package of information off to the assistant to Senator Feinstein. I'm getting no response from Senator Wyden's office, but if you live in Oregon, you can contact me, and I'll send you the information I sent to their assistant. Um, Brian Anderson is the so-called nuclear expert with Senator Feinstein. And I can give you his number in Washington, D.C. He's apparently an NRC a nuclear expert, 202-224-3841. And uh, you just asked for his extension. Uh, that's Senator Feinstein's uh, expert. But when I asked him, you know, when I made the statement that the EPA were not doing their job and that the RADnet was not properly being managed, and, in fact, a lot of the, the RADnet sites were shut down, like the Idaho site, when it spiked, in radiation, they haven't properly repaired or expanded their sites. They're not testing food or water. They're not testing fish in the Pacific Ocean and giving regular reports. And there's no plume analysis either with air, which we call uh, weather balloons or drones, or even putting commercial airliners or special military jets to actually record radiation and give us a plume map in real time of what's going on. And I'm sure the public wants a plume map so they know what the hell's happening to Fukushima at any day. So if you have flight let's say American Airlines flight A1374 flying from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., you want to know if halfway through your flight, if you're going to fly through a giant radiation plume that could be very, very dangerous. A good idea, wouldn't it be? Right, and, and we're trying to put together a, a plume map, so to speak, just by doing a forecast three times a week that air on the YouTube, on the Fukushima Effect site, and on Orion every hour. And then using some of the crowdsourced data, we can go back and check, well, you know, how, how correct were we in our yeah. assessments? Well, and uh, well, about 95% of the time, we've been accurate. Yeah. If, we, if we, we, can, we could refine that, too, if we had a, uh, um, I can say, a real-time plume map drawing program where we would upload data from somebody. All you need is a laptop. I got software already, and I'm putting up my laptops. When I fly next, I'll have my radiation detector. Then I'll be taking GPS coordinated pictures because when you take a picture with your iPhone or with your iPad, it actually does GPS coordinates on it, believe it or not. And you can actually know from your where you're flying and how far you're flying the relative altitude. So you can actually, if you plug those numbers in as to where you are in the flight path and your altitude, I mean, I'm sure that you can contact the airline industry and say, yeah, it's such and such a time into the flight you're at, 25,000 feet or whatever, or even ask the pilot. You could actually probably, at the end, download the data directly to a central clearinghouse, and you'd have uh, flight time, altitude at a specific time, uh, counts per minute, millisieverts per hour, uh, and it would actually create a, a, a data stream. You could then start drawing up maps of where the radiation plumes are and where it's dissipating. And so you might know, let's say, between 26 and 31,000 feet, there's a plume that's, uh, let's say, 12 times background in, in millisieverts per hour uh, that is 240 miles wide and uh, between six, 26 and 31,000 feet and that it's spreading in a specific uh, direction. The general plume is going, say, a south-southwesterly direction. Uh, tracking along the side of the jet stream. See, that's the kind of data that we need to know. And we don't know right now. We have data, uh, and there's a data blackout on purpose because they don't want people like us to just ask questions because we might find new anomalies that may make us have to reevaluate how we're obtaining data. And also, are these aircraft contaminated if they go through a very highly radioactive? Are there seat covers? Is the air filtration system, do they have, should they have an air filtration system reduce the radiation exposure to the people inside the aircraft, but there's no HEPA filters, there's no buckyball uh, filters inside the aircraft, uh, it basically is you just uh, flying ignorant is what it is, flying ignorant, right. even years ago they used to have HEPA filters. When you start talking about decontamination as far as planes go or, or even as our, our uh, crops and, and soil goes, 
um, you know, talking big numbers in terms of cost, which uh, some of the people in the nuke industry that I've talked to have said that's why a lot of this information probably isn't being shared. That they knew that people knew the extent of contamination. The federal or, or local governments would be forced to, to um, you know, go into a, a clean up, cleanup effort, which is going to cost a lot of money. Cool. You know, we wouldn't want to have that, would we? Contamination with the airlines as well. Well, yeah, and the fact is that they might have to have, uh, you know, a decon seat cover that they'd have to remove and put in a hazmat bag. They might have to have a chain of custody for every aircraft with a capsule that would then give not only the level of counts but also the radioisotope profile so we know which isotope so we get an idea. From that plume, we could kind of back calculate what we call the nuclear, uh, if you want to call it forensic autopsy intellectual autopsy you'd say oh because we see this isotope likely there's a certain kind of critical reaction happening so it would tell us which part of the plant is probably the source of the problem um, that's important because it tells us what remediation things we're doing on the ground are actually reducing the damage to the troposphere the atmosphere and how much is being released in the ocean because nobody's doing ground penetrating radiator to know where the chlorium is no one's seeing if there's steam tubes that are going out into the pacific ocean or to other parts of Honshu or even connecting to tube trains for the uh, underground uh, subway that goes all the way into north of uh, Tokyo and other areas nearby where it could be going 20, 30, 40 kilometers from the site created by high pressure steam generated uh, tubes that might be connecting through fault lines in the rock. So we don't know. Uh, we, I mean, we just don't know. We don't know. And the more questions we ask, the more we get stonewalled or told that we, it's a conspiracy theory. We shouldn't ask these tough questions. Cancer is going to save the economy. By the, save the, the economy? And get to our health care system. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it, well first off, they, I'm also going to get experts on talking about the a new bill in, in California, because California, if the doctors prescribe or recommend anything other than what I call the commando approach, which is high-dose radiation, chemotherapy, and uh, uh, commando-type surgery, the doctors can lose their license and or go to jail. Yeah. And uh, that needs to stop. Uh, and, I, and I'm not talking about, you know, doing rational care, which is like Dr. Brzezinski's care, which is uh, chemotherapy that's low dose based on genetic testing, surgery that uh, should never be done until you start chemo because you always spread tumors, uh, nutraceutical therapies that can dramatically increase the effectiveness of, of treatment, uh, and also no high dose radiation. High dose radiation is very dangerous, very stupid, doesn't work. Uh, and um, if we're going to do any kind of treatment, it has to actually be targeted to the tumor, so, uh, such as new novel therapies, such as high-energy uh, therapy using various radio-labeled uh, uh, chemicals that can attach, and you can use light therapy to activate chemical reactions that can destroy tumors or immunological. Um, yeah, well, a lot of people don't realize when you have a, a tumor excision, cancerous tumors like growing on a dandelion seed, it sheds cells and exactly. travels to all the organs right. in the body, especially those that have a high rate of perfusion like the well, brain. Well, and if you have a high level of VEGF, vegetarian angiothelial growth factor, the tumor's got a high level of VEGF in their blood because you're pre-diabetic or hyperinsulinemic, the tumor's going to spread like crazy. So you have to be on nutraceuticals and chemo first if you're going to do any surgery, or you're going to spread it like crazy. And I'm talking about low-dose chemo based on nutrigenomic testing. Thank you, Christina. We'll have you back soon. Ryan is coming up with Nutrimeds and Phil Brolic. And hour number three, taxtherich.name.